this microphone is recording the soundscape and all the different sounds from birds, amphibians, and then the data are uploaded to a cloud system. And there we can then analyze these sounds immediately. To avoid biodiversity loss, you will first need to understand how much biodiversity you have. I'm on the shores of Lake Neusiedl in Austria, the home to a host of endangered species. Now a new system is in place to keep track of them by listening to their voices. The reed belt area is, for me, is really a, a fascinating habitat because from, from the vegetation side, from a vegetation point uh -huh. of view, this is more or less a monoculture. Arno Chimadon is a ranger in the Lake Neustadt National Park and manager of its biodiversity monitoring program. Migratory birds in spring, they come to the breeding grounds, to, to Lake Neusiedl, to the reed belt, for example, and they want to get a very nice spot for breeding. And so the first birds, the first males who arrive, they are able to choose the best spots. And so in theory, you would uh, say, you would hypothesize that the best territories are occupied first. But keeping track of those early arrivals and all other inhabitants of the reed beds involves a mix of human expertise and technology. So is this a sampling site? Yeah, this is uh, one of our sampling sites with the edge devices and they are collecting the sound mm -hmm. of this area here. We can just collect these devices with the stick. Up. And there it is. And the device is in here in this bag. And we have set it up so that it collects one minute sample every 10 minutes. So this is basically the whole device. So it's the battery. And this is a, looks quite simple. You see this little hole, that is the microphone. Mm -hmm. And on the other side of the device, you see at the moment this uh, red flashing light. So this says that now it's recording and when it then stops recording, then you will see a green flashing light. And this is the SD card where the data is then stored. This is recording 24 hours a day. Yes, exactly. So it's recording 20, for 24 hours a day, but only one minute every 10 minutes. So how many hours of data would that be in a month? So it's uh, 144 minutes of files per day, and then you can yeah, do the calculations. So in a month it would be then times 30, something like that. And But all together with all the 60 stations we have here in the reed belt, collecting such a, a lot of data, we are up um, several terabytes already on So data. there were 68 devices like this? Yes, the set out in the reed belt. So what's the next step? So the next step would be that we have to uh, connect or to, to say to the device that it is deployed, it is set up at that site. I have here on my phone an app, it's called the Companion app. I can just say we want to add another edge device and set the deployment site. And this site is called BN04. What's BN? BN is um, burning site new. Oh. So that's the, the, the site where the last fire was two years ago. So how come you get burning in a wetland? Well, if you look at the ground here, it is dry. So the, the structure, which is just laying on top of this soil is completely dry. And also the, reed, the old reed stems. This is just in winter time, it's completely dry. So it burns very, very easily. But from an ecological point of view, uh, fire in the reed belt is nothing bad. It depends all on the time of the year. Of course, if you get a fire in the mid of breeding season, that is worst case scenario for all the birds. But the fire in winter time, that is good because then you get a new uh, disturbance in these reed structures. And so the reed is also a bit uh, yeah, pushed to grow again faster and, and bigger. And so that is also one way how you get different kinds of structures in the reed belt. So it can be good for biodiversity. It can be good and, and from our point of view, it should be even implemented as management strategy for the reed belt. So now we will uh, collect the data, take the SD card with us 
and uh, put a new one in so that we can deploy it and put it back in the field. So this will now start another three months of recording. Yes, exactly. So we will pack it up again and put it up there and then I will be back in about three months collecting the data. Monitoring the use of such a dynamic ecosystem needs dynamic monitoring tools. Catherine the Rider works with technology company Huawei, which has provided monitoring equipment. Wow, so Anna, what do we have here? This is uh, one of our guardians. It's actually a very uh, cool device because uh, it's more or less autonomous. So we have here the solar panels so that we get the energy supply for the device. Mm. Inside this box, we have the batteries. And then with this microphone, the, the device is recording the soundscape and all the different sounds from birds, amphibians. And with this antenna, we get the connection to the mobile network and then the data are uploaded to a cloud system. And there we can then analyze these sounds immediately. And so where does this idea come from? It was developed together with Rainforest Connection originally. Um, and there was a cooperation. Um, originally, the idea came up from the rainforest in terms of illegal logging or um, hunting. And uh, so what they did, they installed this kind of devices mm. and had directly the message to their mobile phone. There's an app and they can see, OK, there is an incident happening uh, out there. And then they can uh, take the team and the rangers and drive and check what is happening. So that was also one of the reasons why they developed that and together with the technology development mm -hmm. and um, with the idea um, of um, Huawei, together they produce this kind of um, devices. So what's the benefits of having it recording 24 hours a day? Uh, of course, you don't lose anything. And the other thing is that uh, especially uh, what we still lack for our area here for the reed belt, we lack a, a lot of information what is going on during night and what is going on uh, during the non-breeding season. So we would really like to see what, what, which species are actually using this uh, area in winter time, for example, and also what kind of activities we can detect uh, during uh, night. This is still a bit of a black box. So how many uh, AI guardians are here in the uh, area? We, within the, this uh, project, together with Huawei and Rainforest Connection, we have two of these devices. One is here in the reed belt and the other one is then in another spot of the reed belt. But uh, our main focus is uh, using these uh, offline devices, the smaller ones, which uh, are for our purpose also very ideal. When we started our cooperation, you told me how you did the monitoring before. Well, that was and still is labor intensive because we went into the reed with a big ladder and then you climbed up the ladder and then you, we were just listening like the device for five minutes, which uh, birds are calling and how many of them. What ears of people can do is uh, we have two and so we can hear stereo and with that ability, we can also detect the distance of a bird species and also how many different individuals of the same bird species. This is so far with this technology not so easily possible. So we do not get rid of all the scientists in the field, but this is a very nice additional uh, way of gathering data because sending people 24 hours over the whole year, that is not possible. The Reed Belt is a unique ecosystem bordering other ecosystems and must be managed appropriately. If I'm going to understand all of that, I need to overcome my fear of heights. Here you have a nice view of, of part of the Lake Neusiedl. And in this area here, we have a big enclosure and there we keep Hungarian grey cattle and even water buffaloes. They are very important here because they are our co-workers for nature protection because they manage to push the reed back into the lake and create, as you can see here, these open areas with open soils and also salt-influenced soils where then, where you see these reddish plants, where then really special plants can grow which are adapted to soils. And these are also areas which are preferred by birds. For example, the grey lake geese, they really like these open grasslands with a low vegetation where they can uh, feed and, and, and grow their young. 
So why does Huawei want to be involved in a project like this? Huawei believes that digital technology is helpful for the society, for companies, for every human being and also for different species because um, technology can help in terms of sustainability to protect the environment and to help societies in uh, different uh, fields. Many would say this is just a big company greenwashing. What do you say to that? No, I can definitely say it's not. Huawei has a clear strategy in terms of sustainability. Mm -hmm. One is in terms of education, and also in Austria have different projects um, for the educational um, reason. We also have the environmental protection where Tech for All is one of the biggest part, and we are also part of that here. We also support a lot of startups, um, uh, not only in Austria, but also in, in uh, other countries worldwide. This project has been in place for a year now. Are you happy with the results? Yeah, we are in the middle of the project now. As we have collected over 1.4 million sound files, that means we are now going into the analysis phase. Mm -hmm. And the plan is through AI, the, the scientists here are able to match the, the different patterns of sounds and really to see the development of the, the species, like they have then the sound files and they can do bad analysis. They could not do that by themselves because that would be not possible to collect so many data in that time. Overseeing the data collection and AI development is Dr. Christian Schulz from the Department of Botany and Biodiversity Research at the University of Vienna. You've got thousands of hours of data. How can you possibly go through all of it? You can imagine when you would have to check all these sound files manually, but just playing them and listening to them, this would be extremely time consuming. We are using software able to identify species for all these individual sites which produce certain sounds there. Can we hear one of the sound files? Well, of course. We are using sound recordings of a length of 60 seconds, meaning one minute. Mm. And here, just within this relatively short sequence, you see a lot of different signals. Mm. And all these different signals are representing different bird species. Here we are. So now you can hear this, this song of the blue throat, which is not a very loud song, but very complex. Let's move forward to the, the common red shank. Very typical song. So how does the system work? So at the beginning, you really need bird experts of ornithologists to tell the software how the signal of a call of a certain bird species should look like. And then you are using this example to tell the software for what the software should search for within these ten thousands of sound files. And what you see here is the result of such a pattern matching for a very common species, the pheasant. However, not all of these identified um, sounds really are calls produced by a pheasant. So the software is not 100% perfect and that's why you need expertise because you now have to tell the software what is a true positive, meaning a correctly identified sound, and what is an incorrectly identified sound. But in the future, we would like to see that the software is getting better in identifying the bird sounds, so that's not necessary anymore to always need experts to go through all these files. And, and that's why we are now trying to implement artificial intelligence, machine learning, to improve this approach, so meaning we will provide to this so-called neural network, which we are using here. A lot of examples, of course, our target species, and this software will combine this information and will learn to more perfectly identify individual bird species from the provided sound files. So why these locations? The reed bed is aging and dying back, and this has negative consequences for this bird fauna of the reed bed, which is of high conservation value. So we have to think about perhaps um, certain management measures which will improve the situation again for birds. And one idea is 
to use fire management of the reed bed to renew the, the reed in a way to produce different successional stages of the reed. This means we have a kind of a time series ranging from very young reed areas because there was a huge reed fire just two years ago to areas which were burned 20 years ago, to areas which apparently were not affected by reed fires during the last decades. And a fourth habitat type, the transition zone between the wetland area, characterized by reed, and more open areas, um, for example, fallows, pastures, and so on. And, and this, is, this transition area is also um, extremely interesting in terms of, of, of conservation because some bird species are really specialized to occur in this um, transition area. And there's another type of transition area we haven't visited yet. Usually we have higher water levels from autumn on towards winter and, and, and spring and then during the hot summers the water levels decrease. The last years we had very dry winters, so the lake was not able to get refilled. And so in the summertime this year, the water level decreased further down. And now, as you can see, the reed belt is completely dry. But this is nothing bad. It just belongs to this whole ecosystem, so that you, we have years where there's a lot of water and years where there's not less water or even drying out like, like now. And this area here is usually covered by water. And for example, in the soils then, once there is a water column above the soil, there is no good possibility of oxygen coming into the soils. And so in, under these conditions, for, it's very difficult for the reed to grow into these areas. Well, now it's dried up. And so now we have again connection with the air and soil and so a lot of exchange of gases and those are exchange of oxygen going into the soil and now the, root, the, the reed gets the impulse to start growing also in these areas where it was not before and actually you can see these are all new reed shoots which uh, were just growing this year and we will of course follow this process and see what's going on in the following years if it will grow uh, even more and uh, we will also see what happens when the water is coming back. So this dynamics in water levels is key for the whole ecosystem and we should keep this dynamics as, as uh, big as possible.